but it's a very important topic. Um, ankle fractures in children, physical injuries are the commonest reason why I do um, secondary deformity correction surgery in terms of how many referrals I receive from other places. Yeah, So it's a very common uh, area where errors are made. We'll start off with uh, some ARS. ARS. Uh, which of the following physis is last to fuse? Medial tibia, lateral tibia, central tibia, fibula. Please, music is on. So everyone thinks medial tibia. Okay. Most are saying medial tibia. Okay. Um, the answers will be in the talk. Um, what is the mechanism of injury of this particular fracture? Is it a supination inversion, pronation eversion, external rotation, supination external rotation, or supination plantar flexion? Does anyone know what this classification is? Log Hansen classification. So this is the Log Hansen. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this, with these terminologies. So most of you think that this is a pronation eversion external rotation. Okay, that's good. So we'll have a look at that as well. So growth arrest is commonest complication of which type of injury? So which type of um, Log Hansen injury has the greatest? Again, so you think pronation, eversion, external rotation has the, the previous X-ray that has the highest rate of so just remember what your answers were and just follow the, the talk closely to see if you have. Okay. So most people think pronation acceleration. So we'll, so this is a very long talk. I don't know if I'll be able to complete it. There are 78 slides. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I didn't do it. So uh, we'll look at the anatomy. Uh, we'll look at uh, clinical examination, diagnosis, classification and management. It's a very common site of physial fractures in children, very common in adolescents. These are called transitional fractures. So there are lots of ligamentous structures that attach around the ankle, which makes the distal tibia and fibula more prone because the ligaments attach distal to the physis. So the ligaments are stronger than the physis, therefore that makes physial injuries more common. Uh, ossification center of the distal tibia appears somewhere between um, six months to two years, and then the distal fibula appears, and then the medial malleolus. And then they all start to close between 15 to 17 years. And there is asymmetrical closure, as in it starts in one part and then gradually spreads across the physis, which is what makes physial injuries more common in the adolescent. So this is the typical pattern of how, from a younger child, you gradually progress to skeletal maturity. Then you can have high or low energy and direct or indirect mechanisms. Obviously, on clinical examination, you want to look at the whole ankle. You want to look at def deformity, uh, tenderness, uh, swelling, do a proper neurovascular examination, and also look for toe movements, and we'll come to toe movements later. So it's important to take three views, AP lateral and mortis. And this is the importance of the mortis view. When you take a mortis view, you tend to see the distal tibial epiphysis in, um, in, its, in its exact AP, or else you'll get a slightly rotated film and you may not, you may miss subtle injuries in the distal tibial epiphysis. CT scan is often used to assess articular involvement. For instance, this injury, very innocuous looking X-ray, but when you take a CT scan, you can see that the, it's an intra-articular fracture and the epiphysis is shattered into many pieces. So there are lots of instances when we would do a CT scan whenever there is doubt, and particularly when the clinical features like swelling, tenderness is out of proportion to the X-ray, Always go with your clinical gut feeling and get a CT scan and you might be surprised by what you see. Once you confirm the fracture, you want to know what is the direction of screw fixation, etc., to know your fragments. So CT scan is useful for that as well, for pre-op planning. We use Salter Harris and Diastagian. So the Diastagian classification is basically the pediatric equivalent of the log hands and it uses the same terms. So it tells you what the structural pattern of the classification is and what are the treatment options. Um, so this is the Salter Harris type 2 pattern, uh, Salter Harris type 3 pattern, <clears throat> and then you have the uh, Diastagian classification. 
So this is the supination inversion, pronation, eversion, external rotation, supination, external rotation, and the supination, plant deflection. So these are the four classical patterns or mechanisms of injury in children. So these are the counterpart, pediatric counterparts of the log Hansen classification. So supination inversion, that's what happens. So the fibula goes first and then the tail is um, in, inverts within the mortise and it knocks the medial malleolus off. So that is the mechanism. So this is a typical injury where you see a, a assault iris type three fracture of the medial malleolus. And these are really <clears throat> very deceptively uh, simple injuries, but they have a very high rate of growth arrest and secondary displacement. So it has the highest incidence of growth arrest and virus. And once you get this complication, it's very, very difficult to get out of. So it's best to manage it. Uh, if it's minimally displaced, less than one millimeter, you can treat it uh, with casting, uh, with close radiographic supervision. But I think in vast majority of cases, it's better to just put a single percutaneous screw like that and get anatomical reduction. Um, <clears throat> So um, you get vertical shear forces acting on this fracture and that's the reason it displaces and shear forces are best neutralized by a intra-epiphyseal pin rather than putting it trans-epiphyseally. So that is the best way of fixing this fracture and intra-epiphyseal screw. So that's an example of a displaced fracture being successfully managed with the screw. You can always do an arthrogram if you, if you are in doubt to make sure that you have restored good articular congruity. Same thing for a salt iris type four, a vertical fracture, again, with shear forces. So you put two screws on either side of the physis, parallel to the physis, and again, that neutralizes the shear forces. So pronation, eversion, external rotation injury is when you get displacement together of the uh, distal tibia with a salt or two and a metaphyseal fracture of the fibula. So this is, again, a classical injury that you see. And close reduction and casting is uh, a viable option because you have a large um, fracture surface and it is an extra articular injury and there is some potential for remodeling. But if you have more than two millimeters during close reduction in OT, if you have more than two millimeters of a gap, particularly medially, you may have to make a small incision and pull the periosteum out. So is there any uh, value to removing the soft tissue interposition? There are uh, papers for and against. Uh, but if you are not able to get a proper reduction and there is a wide gap medially, I think it's reasonable to make a small incision and pull the periosteum out. And, but that does not necessarily reduce your risk of growth arrest. So supination external rotation injury is, a, is a, like a spiral injury. And um, the way to reduce this is to reverse the mechanism and you basically internally rotate the distal fragment to close the fracture and you manage it in um, cast for four to six weeks time. Supination plant deflection is um, the typical uh, frac you know, forced plant deflection. And the proximal fragment basically goes and pushes against the um, extensor tendons. Um, and it can cause um, a particular problem we'll come to later. Um, so manipulative procedure is basically to reverse the mechanism of injury. Um, and if you are not able to get proper reduction or proper, you're not able to hold it in plaster, perfectly reasonable to apply to anteroposterior percutaneous screws. So transitional fract fractures happen because there is a closure of the uh, distal tibial physis from medial to lateral. So lateral remains um, open for a longer period of time. So central physis closes first, and then it goes to medial and then lateral. So most of you said that it was the medial tibial physis that closed first. It's actually starts in the middle, goes medially, and then last um, is the lateral side. Um, so because of early closure of the medial tibial physis, you get this specific pattern where the lateral, laterally you get a uh, epiphyseal injury and medially you get a metaphyseal injury. So this is a triplane fracture, um, often missed on AP and lateral radiographs. So you have to imagine that this is a 3D fracture pattern and uh, be able to understand how exactly this fracture um, geometry is so that you can fix it appropriately. So um, undisplaced triplane fractures, rarely are they so undisplaced that you will manage them non-operatively. At the very least, you have to do a close reduction. But because all triplane fractures are by definition intra-articular, I think it's better to do a close reduction and percutaneous spinning. Um, so this is what you would typically do. Put a screw uh, from lateral to medial to close down that telo fragment and then put one or two anteroposterior screws to 
uh, stabilize the metaphyseal fragment. So, and then you can always do an orthogram to assess articular congruity. And then you have the isolated tilo fracture, which is just an avulsion injury of the distal tibio, inferior tibiofibular ligament. And again, this can be fixed with a single screw. A CT scan is invaluable in assessing the uh, assessing these injuries. And early diagnosis is very, very important. So a mortise view or CT scan will tell you what is the exact plane and what is the geometry of the fracture so that you can pass your screw perpendicular to the fracture site. So, um, so most telo fractures, I think, would be managed operatively, at least with a close, close reduction and percutaneous spinning. You can open them if you have any doubts about the quality of your reduction. So this is just an example of a telo fracture. Uh, distal fibular fractures are extremely common. They can be type 1 or uh, just a fracture through the uh, physis or it can have a small um, metaphyseal fragment, a salt iris type 2 fra fracture. And these um, heal very quickly uh, in cash for 3 to 4 weeks. Some of them don't even require immobilization if they look stable. Complications are growth arrest. Growth arrests are extremely, the, the rates are extremely high and it happens irrespective of treatment and irrespective of displacement, so close radiographic follow-up is important. Uh, if you have, if you leave an articular step, obviously you can get arthritis. In summary, uh, so this, this type of um, um, uh, supination plantar flexion injury, you can get something called retinaculum syndrome. So retinaculum syndrome is when they have uh, inability to move the toes, it is because the proximal fragment goes and tents all the extensor um, structures against the extensor retinaculum. So these require urgent reduction um, or people have described a kind of compartment syndrome um, type picture and some late uh, neurological weakness, etc. if this retinaculum syndrome is not uh, corrected, identified and corrected early. Um, with the Salter 2, obviously you have to think about the periosteal flap. Salter 3, think about the tilo fragment and how we are going to pass that screw. And Salter 4, triplane fracture where you need epiphyseal and metaphyseal screws. So in summary, you, need, you might need to do a CT scan to understand the pathology. So fracture patterns depend on age and mechanism. Always suspect a physial injury. Gentle reduction to avoid damage to the physis, avoid repeated attempts, achieve congruity or articular surface, and careful follow-up to identify any uh, growth disturbance. Thank you very much.